So welcome to our English worship this morning. Four weeks ago, we began a four-part sermon series. So today will be the last sermon in the series on First and Second uh, First Corinthians chapter one and two. The title of that sermon series is Gospel to Hong Kong. So we ask this very important question: What kind of a gospel does Hong Kong need? What kind of a good news does Hong Kong need? And the answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Christ crucified. You see, in around this time、uh, every year, Chinese New Year, there are variety of gospel floating around. Let's pray for Hong Kong. You know, the Christian would say, pray for more prosperity and stability. You know,、um, and and all that. But that's not the gospel we talk about. That's not the gospel the Bible talks about. The gospel of Christ crucified is a gospel that calls us to confess our sin and lean on Christ for His righteousness. It is also a gospel that calls us to flee from the city of man to seek after the heavenly city of God. It is a gospel that calls us to forsake money, sex, and power, so that we may pursue eternal heavenly treasures. In Jesus Christ, this is the gospel that Hong Kong needs. This is also the gospel the Apostle Paul brought to Corinth some two thousand years ago. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel. This is what he writes: "For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved." It is the power of God, and he continues in First Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty-two to twenty-four. For the Jew demands signs or miracles, and the Greeks seek wisdom, worldly wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and a folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks. Christ, the power, and Christ, the wisdom of God. I want you to see how the gospel of Christ crucified would divide the world into two halves, two very uneven halves. So on one end, you have a group dashing towards the wrath of God and eternal punishment. Then on the other side, you have those who taking an exit. You know,、uh, you turning to seek after life eternal, the everlasting glory and riches that God promised to those who seek after Him. You see, the way of the cross offers sinner the only route of escape. You see, we're all born into an hell-bound express. We're on this highway. You know, every one of us. Until we saw the exercise, and then we got a chance to U-turn to make the escape route, so that we may be saved. Is it the power of God and the wisdom of God? The choice between these two paths take us into First Corinthians chapter two. So, if you have been with us, you know that there are sixteen verses of it, and I have used three sermons to cover them. We have covered so far two speeches. From chapter two, verse one to five, and then two wisdoms, chapter two, verse six to nine. And today, we'll concentrate on the last of the three, two spirit, chapter two, verse ten to sixteen. So, sixteen verses can be divided into three segments: two speeches, two wisdoms, and two spirits. And they together will create two peoples. Two people, the city of God and the city of man. Two peoples on two very different paths, eventually leading to very two very different ends: eternal life and eternal punishment. Now I want you to think about this: when the apostle Paul first came to Corinth, to that ancient city of man, you know there was nothing of a church. So he came. He came. He employed plain speech of truth. He proclaimed the wisdom of God 
the gospel of Christ crucified. And then Paul was led by the Spirit of God. If you get a chance to go back to your Bible to read about Paul's encounter, uh, 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 you know, how Paul come to, came to um, uh, Corinth. You know, he was led by the Spirit of God. It is the Spirit of God who asked Paul to stay in Corinth from an extended period of time so that a church may be established. So we have the plain speech of truth, we have the wisdom of God, and we have the Spirit of God on one side. Countering Paul on the other side was a spirit of the world proclaiming the wisdom of man, employing lofty speech, a technical term for rhetorical showmanship popular in first century Greco-Roman world. So if you have been with us uh, in the past, you know uh, you know, this is lofty speech. It's a kind of performance. It's a kind of showmanship. So once again, two speeches, two wisdom, two spirit, forming two peoples on two paths, two or two ends in eternity. So once upon a time, I want you to think about this. Brother and sister of the Corinthian church were just like the rest of the city. Once upon a time. They were, if, I to, if I'm to borrow Paul's word from Ephesians chapter 2, they were dead in trespasses and sin, in which they once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of this obedience among whom they all once lived in the passions of their flesh, carrying out the desire of the body and of the mind. That's true for everyone before they became Christian. So once upon a time, there, there, there were no church in Corinth, and everyone, you know, currently in the Corinthian church are just like that. And they sought after money, sex, and power. They immersed themselves in the spirits of the world, the wisdom of man and lofty speech. Lofty speech is something that fills the entire city. Everybody loves to, to, to watch a show. Everybody would love to hear that lofty speech. And what will be the equivalent of lofty speech to today's world, you may think about. So as I ponder about it, I think uh, the, the best equivalent I can think of, of lofty speech is all the advertising and propaganda we encounter here each and every day. So imagine that if you are coming to uh, Causeway Bay, you know, on MTR, whether you get out at Teen House or Causeway Bay, the first thing that welcome you as you walk out of the MTR or walk into the MTR station, uh, plenty, plenty of advertising. And you think that, well, no, I don't look at those things, and they don't affect me. No, they do. And if they don't, why would people pay so much money to put the advertisement on that? So those are the lofty speech that is affecting us. And they proclaim to us the wisdom of man in the spirit of this world. How do you know? Because everything they sell you is something that you can touch with your hands and see with your eyes. They are selling something to you that is of this world. But Paul is preaching something that is of another world. Eyes cannot see, hands cannot touch. It is totally something utterly different. And you wonder, how could he even sell the gospel to the Corinthians who are so obsessed with this life? Well, Paul came to the city of men, staging a good fight, fight with plain speech of the truth, proclaiming the gospel of Christ crucified and therefore breaking the bondage of sin for God's chosen one. Now, in order to set the people free, you begin to realize you need a third element. The first element is plain speech of truth. He's not going to use lofty speech. The second thing, he proclaimed the cross. You see, it's right there in the middle. He proclaimed the gospel of Christ crucified, but there's a third element that is absolutely necessary for bondage to be broken. And that is the Spirit of God. The Spirit must come to break people from the bondage of sin. 
So today, a lot of people like to talk about Holy Spirit. And if you uh, ever got a chance to go to a variety of Christian churches, people would say, oh, you know, I'm all excited about the Holy Spirit. They would tell a story about how the Spirit lead them, uh, help them. I have a dream last night, the Spirit is speaking this to me. And the Spirit really helped me in my study today, in my exam today, in my uh, interview today. You know, the Spirit is leading me, guiding me. The Spirit did miracle in my life. The Spirit caused my disease to cease and all these. All these stories, unfortunately, are not true work of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we know? Because we turn to the Bible. When you turn to the Bible, when you turn to the New Testament, you begin to learn that the most important work of the Holy Spirit is not to do the above. The most important work of the Holy Spirit is to grant us a new life. To grant us a new life through the proclamation of the gospel. That means if you don't preach the gospel, the Spirit cannot work. The Spirit can only work if you preach Christ crucified. And when you do, and when the Spirit comes and works in your life, what the Spirit will give you is a new brain. It's a new brain on top of another brain, a new mind, a new pair of eyes, and a new heart. Remember, I love that illustration. You got a PhD. Not in the sense that you got a doctor of philosophy, but rather you got something far more valuable, permanent head damage. That is the PhD that we all should be seeking. And with that PhD, you are set free from the bondage of money, sex, and power. And so that empower us, enable us to say no to lofty speech, no to the wisdom of man, and no to the spirits of this world. Now that takes us to our passage this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11. I'm actually going to just talk about three verses. So we'll start with 10 and we'll end with 12. This is the word of the Lord. These things, Paul says, God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. So the Spirit searches the depths of God and reveals to us these things. What are these things? What are these things? Well, we'll come back to that uh, very soon. Read the next verse. Chapter 2, verse 11. For who knows a person's thought except the spirit of that person? So also no one comprehends the thought of God except the spirit of God. So you see, you need the spirit of God to comprehend the things of God, the thoughts of God. Now, of course, if you have been listening to my sermon, you will uh, know that a better translation is not so that you will comprehend, but rather that so also no one comprehends and love the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Knowing whether it's in the Old Testament Hebrew or in the New Testament Greek means something more than a head knowledge. It is not a head knowledge that the Spirit of God will give us. The Spirit of God will give us understanding, of course. The Spirit of God will give us a genuine love of the things of God will give us true love for the truth from our heart. So now we are ready to tackle the, the things of God. So what are the things of God that the Spirit will, will empower us to comprehend and love? And the answer is the verse before. Right? The verse before is chapter 2 verse 9, which we already studied last week. And this is chapter 2, verse 9. As it is written, What no eye has seen, nor ears heard, nor heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. As it is written, it is a formula about Old Testament quotation. Paul, being a Jew, is quoting from the Old Testament. Which book? The book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4, if you remember from last week and you know i said it's such a long book and i said tell us that god had prepared something for the people who love him who wait upon him something that no eye have seen no ears have heard no mind have ever conceived what is that something and you may say i don't know pastor lamb i mean I, I, I barely read through Isaiah, 66 chapter, long book. By the time I get to the end, I don't remember anything before. But actually, you do know there was something in the book of Isaiah that everyone 
you know, even if you've just been to church for a few months. And that something is Isaiah 53, God provided for us a suffering servant. Every year around Easter time, you know, during Good Friday, you will hear, uh, the, you know, uh, reciting of Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. It is the most precious gift God has prepared for everyone who love him or who wait upon him. What can the suffering servant do for you? Definitely not for your exam, not for your job interview, not to provide you financial counsel. The suffering servant does one thing, provide you with the forgiveness of sins. It is the gift of righteousness for sinners that God has prepared for those who love him. So we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit come, the Spirit of God come, so that we may comprehend, believe, and love from our heart Jesus Christ, the suffering servant, God's most precious gift to all. So it's not just that I'm telling you about Jesus, and it's not just that you are hearing it with your ears, but the Spirit is going to make that truth come alive for you. Don't worry if you don't know what I'm talking about, I will illustrate that in just a little bit. Let's read one more verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand the things freely given us by God. The thing freely given us by God is the gifts of salvation. It's the suffering servant. So that we may understand, we may believe, we may love the things freely given us by God. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit of God to come so that we will love the gift of redemption. We will treasure it so that the gift will grow bigger and bigger in our heart. How? Well, Jesus in John chapter 16, verse 7 and 8, had this interesting uh, the dialogue with his disciples about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus was saying goodbye to them and telling them he has to go to the cross and then he will be raised from the dead and then he will ascend and return back to his father. And he said, I have to go. If I do not go, the Spirit will not come. And then he began to explain to them the significance of the Spirit's coming. But if I go, I will send the Helper, the Holy Spirit, to you. And when the Spirit comes, he will do what? He's not going to help you with your homework. He's not going to help you, you know, uh, find a husband or wife. He is going to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment so that we may know the reality of our sins and we may know the reality of eternal judgment. You see, the Spirit will do this thing to us, make us realize our sins are real. So it's one thing to have a conceptual understanding that, yeah, I'm not a good boy, I'm not a perfect person. It's quite another to think that woe to me, a sinner before this holy God. It's quite something to think about there is a hell. It's quite another thing to say that I am going to hell. And so the Spirit will come to convict the world and us about sin and judgment. But he will also convict us to know righteousness to know and to love the righteousness that is only in Christ. So what would the Spirit do for us? It is what the theologian call a saving knowledge of Christ. The theologian say the Spirit will come and give us a saving knowledge. It's not head knowledge. It's a heart knowledge to give us this saving love for Christ, the gift that God has prepared for us. So I want to turn to my friend, J.I. Packer, my best friend, have been for the past few months. I want to turn with you again to Concise Theology. Uh, it's my favorite book because it's brief and simple, and it's just the best. So in Concise Theology, there was a chapter on the illumination, enlightening of the Holy Spirit. That is the most important work, you may say, of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will bear witness to our sin will bear witness to Jesus as the only Savior. The Holy Spirit will witness to us the surety, the certainty of judgment. And listen to J.I. Packer. This is what he writes. 
the knowledge of divine things to which Christians are called is more than a formal acquaintance with biblical words and Christian idea. Do you know what he is talking about? Just because you get an A in your religious studies doesn't mean a thing. You know, so you can have some formal acquaintance. You maybe you go to church, or you grew up in church, you attend the Sunday school, you have know this Bible knowledge. You may even be a top-notch theologian, academic theologian. You know all these Christian idea, but the knowledge of divine thing is something quite another. Is much more than a formal acquaintance with biblical words. So that's why what's the point of knowing Greek and Hebrew if you don't know the Lord and people work hard to master the Greek and Hebrew but they don't work hard in the spiritual pursuit. It's much more than that. It is realizing the reality and relevance of those activities, God saving activities of the triune God to which the scripture testify. Why must there be a plan of salvation? because sin is real, because judgment is real. Such awareness is natural to none. You know, even we can teach our children about it, you know, when they were growing up in church or in school. But this awareness, deep awareness of sin and judgment doesn't come natural. Only the Holy Spirit, searcher of the deeper things of God, can bring about the realization in our sin-darkened mind and heart. That's why you need enlightening, because your heart is sin darkened. Packer continue. The work of the Spirit in imparting this knowledge is called illumination or enlightening. It is shining light into a dark world, a dark heart. It is not a giving of a new revelation. Some people think the Spirit gave me a dream yesterday. Well, it's not going to be recorded in the new version of the Bible. You know why? Because it's the Spirit doesn't come to give us new revelation. It is not a giving of new revelation, but a work within us that enables us to grasp and to love. Remember, you see, to love is not just to grasp it, but to love the revelation that is already there in the Bible before us in the biblical text as heard and read and as explained by the teacher. So you go back home and you may re-listen to this sermon or you read the transcript and one thing you can pray for is for the Holy Spirit to illuminate, to shine light upon what I have taught you or what you have been hearing from the Bible. What is the end goal? To grasp, yes, to love, to love the revelation, to rub the revelation that is in the biblical text. Illumination is thus the applying of God's revealed truth to our heart so that we grasp as reality what the sacred text set forth for us. And finally, illumination, which is a lifelong ministry of the Holy Spirit to Christians, start before the conversion with a growing grasp of the truth about Jesus and growing sense of being measured and exposed by it. What does it mean? You actually, you know, when you, for you to become Christian, you have to realize you're a sinner, right? But the funny thing is, as you grow as a Christian, you will see more and more sins. And more and more things that you previously consider as your strength now become your weakness. And you begin to understand that you think that you have done a good job. You think that God should give you 90 points. And you end up failing the test thoroughly. And that's what the Bible is going to do, us, do for us. That's what the Spirit is going to do for us. When you read the Bible, it's not you reading the Bible, it's the Bible reading you, measuring you, exposing you. But that makes us realize how true the Gospel is. We do need a Savior, and we must love Him and embrace Him. Jesus said that the Spirit would convict the world of sin, of Jesus Himself, and of the reality of judgment. The threefold conviction is God's means of making sin repulsive and Christ adorable in the eyes of the persons. So this theological treatise about illumination actually made me think about the testimony of a seminary professor of mine from 20 some years ago. So let me share with you his story. 
His name is Tim Trumper, Timothy Trumper. His testimony is included in the book title, God Found Me, True Story of People Whose Lives Were Changed by God. He was from Wales, and he came to faith at 15, 15 years old. But the thing is, he had grown up in a, as a PK. You know what is a PK? Pastor's kid. So his father was a pastor. And his father was a faithful preacher of the gospel. So as he became a Christian, he looked back at his first 15 years of his life. He got the privilege of listening to a good gospel of the cross every week. He just wasn't believing it. You know, but his father was a faithful preacher. Uh, or, you know, as he was growing up. But he wasn't com converted until he was 15. And partly because he was always a good boy. And people think that being a good boy means that you are a Christian. And he thought himself to be a Christian until that year. Once again, his name is Tim Trumper, and that's what he wrote concerning the year of his conversion. Although I knew more about God than my peers at school, I did not know God personally. Despite being outwardly upright, I was always aware that there was something blocking me from my maker. None of the spiritual privileges. What are the spiritual privileges? The fact that you're growing in church. You know, is it the fact that you get to go to church, the fact that you have the Bible to read, the fact that you know all these biblical stories. All these are spiritual privileges, so do not despise your spiritual privileges. You know, sometimes I have friends who grew up in churches, I hate growing up in church. Well, you shouldn't. Well, hopefully you, you went to a good church. And you shouldn't because those are your spiritual privileges. None of the spiritual privileges I possessed from birth could close this yawning gulf. I just could not see what the Bible meant by belief. That did not bother me until some unexpected death increased the urgency. It's very fascinating as I read about what makes him feel more urgent about seeking the Lord is that is unexpected, untimely death because he had a peers in his youth group or in his church around 13 or 14 years uh, year old and he was drowned in an accident. And if you get a chance to read Augustine's testimony, you realize that one of uh, the thing that made it more urgent for Augustine to seek God is that he had a friend who died. That made people think about eternity. So he, Tim Chuck, came to the funeral and he was shocked to hear all these testimony from relatives and family of that boy called Paul. And they both witnessed to the fact that how Paul had changed, his life changed because of Jesus. And so he continued to write, I immediately began to wonder whether my relatives would have been so confident on my eternal destiny as Paul's were of his. Although still morally upright, there was no positive difference detect detectable between my friends and me. Our future plan are very similar. Our dreams uh, for what life is is very similar. Only I went without God's presence from my conscious experience simply because I have never crossed over from nominal to biblical Christianity. Now, for some of us, is exactly in this boat that we have been attending church with friends and family. But how do you cross over from nominal Christianity into biblical Christianity? Tim continued. After church one Sunday, when he was 15 still, morning my father seeing my behavioral decline took me to my bedroom with that he simply but piercingly asked the question do you love the lord jesus christ now that is the question to ask any nominal christian who hides behind the veneer of churchianity because it goes right to the heart of the matter the father did not ask do you believe in jesus because if he had asked that Tim probably would say, yeah, of course I believe. I believe. I believe since I was a boy. Jesus is real. He was born 2,000 years. I believe Jesus is God. I believe he is the son of God. I believe everything about him. You know what? Who else believes? Satan also believes. Satan believes everything about Jesus. Everything about the doctrine of Christ. But Satan could not do one thing. He could not love God. 
Satan could not love Jesus Christ. Had he asked anything else, I could have dodged the issue. Instead, the question proved to be a heaven-sent opportunity to shrug off the basket. From the moment I determined to seek God, and even then I was conscious that in reality he was seeking me, God was seeking him. Over the following months, my tribe prayers were swathed for an earnest prayer life. I began to confess to God that my 15-year-old life was indefensible in light of His holiness. Let me tell you, your 75 five, five years old life is also indispensable. Or maybe you're 85. Whatever age you are, you're whatever old, you know, however old you are, you are indefensible in light of that holiness of God. Finally, God was beginning to reveal something of what it means to believe. I have for long enough possess that knowledge that informs faith. Now the Spirit of God was truly convicting me of saying, you see, the work of the Holy Spirit as He showed me its urgency. Intermingle with His this faith was a sincere and tearful repentance. To God I was answerable because it was His standard that I have fallen short of. That summer, I went for the first time to a Christian youth camp. I'm, I really hesitate. I want to cross out that line because I do not want you to go home and start looking for Christian youth camp because there is no good one to go to nowadays. You know, but that was a long time ago, 1981. And later on, as you will see, you know, they still have good Christian youth camp to go to. There I met many young people who evidently knew and loved the Lord and who spoke sincerely to me of what it meant to be a Christian. My conviction of personal sin increased all week, so much so that I finally I could do nothing else but look away from myself in order to collapse on Jesus. How wonderful. Amen. God had finally cornered me. All ifs and buts of self-excuse were gone. There was nothing to do but plead with the Lord that He would forgive my sin and accept me as His own forever. He had heard my prayer, taking away my sin that stood as a barrier between us. He had brought me to Himself. I walk out into the bright morning sunshine with a cheerful thought ringing in my ear. So this is real Christianity. And so it was and continues to be. That was August 1981. Since then, God has never let me down or let me go. Accompanying me were some favorite words from John Newton. I am not what I should be. I am not what I could be. I am not what I shall be hereafter. But I am not what I once was. There was a real change in me. And what I am, I am by the grace of God. So this is real Christianity, a cheerful thought ringing in my head. Now this is indeed the hallmark of a true Christian conversion. You know what is the true mark of a Christian conversion? It's joy. It's joy. He didn't get out of it feeling that this is a decision he had to make. He getting out of it wanting to make that decision and making that decision to submit himself to God with great joy. Some of you know that uh, I often talk about my another professor by the name of St. Clair Ferguson. If you get a chance to listen to Ferguson's conversion story, just he will sneak in a little bit here and there. He talked about being a teenage boy going to a church because the parents want him to be moral than go to church. But he never went there because of the gospel, but he heard the gospel, he heard the gospel, he heard the gospel. And one day his heart was warming up to it and he embraced the Lord Jesus. He talked about walking home in the dark in the evening, singing and dancing on his own. He said, nobody should watch me dance, but I was literally singing and dancing in the dark. Why? Because the hallmark of a true Christian conversion is joy, not grudgingly not reluctantly denying ourselves and following Jesus, but it's a joyful surrender of our self-righteousness, of our former life, joyful surrender of the world, 
so that we may run a heavily raise. It's interesting, if you got a chance to read more about Tim Trumper's conversion story, he talked about one of the hindrances of him becoming a Christian early is that he noticed that despite the fact that he loved his father, his father was an oddball. Because of his Christian conversion, he was lonely in the society. He didn't want to be his father, even though he loved his father. But look at him now. He is gratefully, joyfully, he wants to join his father being an oddball in the world. Joy is the hallmark of a Christian conversion. That makes me think about Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great of a cloud of witnesses, joyful witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. How do you, how do you let go of those things, every weight and sin that clings so closely? Because of joy. And let us run with endurance the, the, the race that is set before us. Look into Jesus. Look at Jesus, how he ran the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame that is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. How did Jesus run? How could Jesus run to the cross for the joy that was set before him? He was running for joy. He was running knowing that the joy would be there for him, the joy of accomplishing salvation. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. So what about us? How do we run? What is going to motivate us? What is going to give us strength to run? The answer is joy. But it is not just for the joy that was set before us. It's also for the joy that was set behind us. So we have joy that was behind us. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and was nailed to the tree for our sake. That was our joy. The joy of redemption accomplished through Jesus at the cross. That is the joy behind us. But we also have a joy before us. The joy of redemption finally completed upon Christ's second coming. You see, what is the Christian life? The Christian life is a life bracketed by joy, the joy of Jesus' first coming and the joy of Jesus' second coming. And with that joy, we run. With that joy, we endure the cross, carrying the cross, despising the shame. So I want you to think about all the people that I mentioned in this series, right? You see how I try to end every sermon with some testimony. And think about the people I've talked to you about. My friend, Dr. Andrew Ng, who served almost 20 years in Africa and then returned to Singapore. Uh, think about Ambrose, uh, sober intoxication of the wine. Think about how he passed on that sober intoxication to St. Augustine. Uh, think about my friend Norman and Faye, who took early retirement to move from UK to Cambodia. I think about my young friend, P.Y. and Susie, with their young boy, how they make that decision to move from Singapore to Philippines so that they can take part in Wycliffe Bible Translation. How do they do it? Why do they do it? For the joy that was behind them and before them. Not because the church decided that we have to have a missionary. So let's draw a lot. And they unhappily got the shot. Scroll. No, it is because of joy. Joy is the hallmark of the Christian life. It's true of the New Testament authors. Think about Paul, think about John, think about Peter. Uh, it is true of Christians throughout all the generation. Look at all these people I talk about. And it's true of me. Why am I who I am today? Because of joy. Because the world could not sell me something that brings me more joy. Because God had in Christ. Jesus given me supreme and everlasting joy. And hopefully that will become true of you also. So let me close our series with one more testimony. One more testimony of joy. Um, I want to share with you the story of Blaise Pascal. You know, I read about uh, him uh, when I was uh, start working, you know, I guess. 
I, I know for you guys are different. You know, when you start working, you got busy. For me, I start working, I got nothing to do. So I start reading. And one of the books I read is about Pascal. It's called The Mind on Fire. Who is Pascal? Well, some of you, if you study STEM, you know Pascal is this famous French mathematician. In fact, he is definitely a genius, a physicist. And later on in his life, he became a philosopher and a theologian. You know, His life was short. He, was, he lived in the 17th century France. His life was only 39 years old. 39, and that's it. He died young. When he was 31, just like the time when Augustine became a Christian, he became a Christian. He had a very profound conversion that changed the whole trajectory of his mind. He had a beautiful mind, but now he had a mind on fire. Let me open with this compelling introduction from the book, The Mind on Fire. After his conversion at the age of 31, Pascal records how his mind blazed with burning conviction of being overwhelmed with light. For many years, he had examined God merely as a series of concepts now he stood before God's presence and the reality of God himself. What is that? Illumination by the Holy Spirit, right? The work of the Holy Spirit. Precisely that. So let me share with you at his conversion. Now this is a man who is rational and logical all his life. But he has such an overwhelming uh, experience at his conversion. He dropped it down. He write it down so that he can save it with himself, keep the note with him the rest of his life. That's what he wrote in that note. The year of grace, 1654, Monday, November 23, 23rd, from about 10.30 p.m. to about 12.30 a.m. Fire. That's how this is described, fire. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosopher and the savings. Well, that sounds like what? First Corinthians. Well, not, the, not the philosophical wisdom of this world, but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Certitude, certitude, feeling, joy, peace, God of Jesus Christ. Now, if I see feeling from a testimony, I usually is a little bit alarmed, but this coming from Pascal, the most rational thinker of his time, perhaps. He said, my God and your God, your God will be my God, from the book of Ruth. Forgetting the world and everything except God, he is only found by the ways taught in the gospel. Righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. That's from the gospel of John. That I have known you is not about him, it's about Jesus Christ. Joy, joy, tears, of joy. This is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and the one you sent, Jesus Christ. That's from John also. I separated myself from him. I fled him. I renounced him. I crucified him. May I now never be separated from him. He is, the, he is only kept securely in the way taught in the gospel. Total, sweet renunciation is not a force renunciation is joyful sweet renunciation total submission to Jesus Christ eternally in joy for a day of trial on earth so you will have suffering on earth but how does that compare with eternal joy eternally in joy for a day of trial on earth may I not forget your words amen so as Crossway celebrate her one month anniversary let me borrow Pascal's word so that we can pray for ourselves in the road ahead. We pray that we're so convinced that Christ is only kept securely by the ways taught in the gospel. And that resulting from that conviction is a total and sweet renunciation, a total submission to our Lord Jesus Christ. So that we may know eternal joy for a short day of trial on earth. May we never forget his word. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, um, we pray that this morning as we dash through um, so many thoughts, that you will place eternity in our heart. I pray that 
whatever that is being spoken um, is not through lofty speech or some plausible words of wisdom, but rather we simply want the world to know about our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that this knowing will not come just from plain teaching. We know that there is a spiritual element to it, that your spirit has to work through the preaching of truth to impart into the hearer the reality of those truths. So we pray for everyone here that there are those who are not yet so Christians, um, and there are those uh, of us who are maybe struggling to grow as a Christian, to break through. May your spirit bring illumination to us so that in the end there will be a joyful renunciation and sweet submission to our Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray that you will put those truths into our heart the way that we may live for your glory. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.